Welcome to this week's program. We're going to be talking about DNA in wines and also the vines, of course, because the vines come before the wines, don't they? And we're also going to be finding out who and what owl farmers. But in just a moment, it's cropping. Dennis Greenbridge. Yes, Rob, as, as we've discussed before, it's not a bridge in Ireland painted green. It's, uh, it's really... <laughs> don't mention the rugby, for goodness sake. No, poor old Irish. <laughs> no, we won't, won't talk to the rugby at all no. because it's, uh, it's good and bad for some. Um, no, the green bridge is basically um, carryover winter crops that are um, past their feeding time or uh, past their maturity time and they haven't been controlled leading into the spring. And those green bridges are a bit, a bit like um, spray misses in a paddock. They harbour um, lots and lots of disease, which comes into the spring and really gets going, and uh, pests as well. So the non-desirable things to bring into the spring and non-desirable if one neighbour's infecting another neighbour and so forth, or even on your own farm. Um, really, you need to get rid of them, spray them out, uh, eat them out, mow them down, do something like that so that they're not the inoculum uh, source for, for uh, fungi and for um, things like aphid which overwinter in them. So, yes, just get rid of those green bridges. Round up. Round up. Exactly. exactly. Good stuff, in that. Good stuff. Now, speaking of, of disease, irrigation is good and bad. Yes, and, and farmers really need to think what they're doing when they're, when they're irrigating. And in crops, they're creating um, a humid atmosphere within the crop. They're also um, emulating uh, rain splash, splash which is... Um, certainly um, something that irrigators do, they can't help but splash the water up through the crop. Mm. And there's two particular diseases, and uh, septoria is one in wheat, which is spread by um, rain splash or irrigation splash. So you're going to sort of uh, stimulate that and spread it through the crop. And the other one is uh, Rhynchosporium cicalis, or scold, in barley, which is a, is a, a wet weather um, disease that's spread by uh, rain splash or irrigation again. So just farmers just think about, you know, where you've been with your irrigator, what you've left behind or potentially left behind. So just um, think right through it. And I guess that means you need to walk your crop very regularly just in case if you need a fungicide. Yes, indeed. And in fact, um, you could almost, if, if the disease is in the crop and you've put the water on, um, it'll be a few days before it shows up, and so you probably should follow up if it fits your um, your cycle of fungicide spraying. You should follow up before the disease is actually broken out, because often it's easier to control um, preventatively than curatively. Yeah, exactly. Yep. What's happening to biosecurity? Well, the government's doing some very good work with various industry bodies, and um, these government industry agreements that they're out there seeking to have industry sign with them um, in terms of biosecurity alerts is, is, um, is really valuable and there's more and more um, industry types, uh, um, uh, MPI type um, primary production industries mm -hmm. signing up with the government so that there's a, there's a set path of uh, action if, if there's an incursion occurs. There is a recognition of um, people within the industry that are affected who may have some expertise to help uh, biosecurity control these things. There is um, uh, some consultation goes on in terms of uh, various actions that can be taken and there is a definite cost sharing benefit for the industry and government if um, an agreement is signed. In other words, it's a blueprint in place and it's sort of a reaction ready type thing if an incursion uh, applies. And so it's very good for the country, very good for the various industries, good for government, good for the taxpayers. If, if there's a um, industry agreement um, signed with the government yeah, exactly. on biosecurity. Knock, knock it out before it hits. Absolutely, Absolutely. or be prepared. Yeah, yeah. Be prepared. We're heading in towards a dry summer, so you'll be saying direct drilling and... Yeah, all those types of things to conserve moisture, um, rolling fields, things like that. They're firming things up, but uh, one autumn thing that can happen in terms of uh, moisture conservation is when a farm is finished with a crop, uh, say grass seed taken silage off it or something like that, it's often rather than leave it there, taking moisture out of the atmosphere, or sorry, out of the soil, is to round up it off, spray it off. In other words, kill it and stop it 
sucking the moisture out of the soil and often it, it then opens up for a second time and there's some seedlings that come through, round up those off again and then you've conserved some moisture there and you can direct drill into that um, lovely clean stale seed bed. So Stale seed bed. Stale seed bed, yes, in other words, if you've cultivated, you've created a new potential strike for weeds, that's what cultivation does. Mm. If it stays hard and bare and not disturbed, it's called a stale seed bed. And the only, the, the only stuff that'll grow is what's put in there by the drill. Effectively, the, the cut that the drill puts in may create a little bit of um, uh, stimulation for seedlings, but it'll be very localised and it won't be... But you've already taken a lot of them off anyway with a second spray. Well, you have indeed, and it's, mm. it's really a, um, um, a cleansing, quarantining type opportunity, basically. Yep. Generic chemicals? Yes, um, just farmers need to be aware of uh, different formulations, different strengths, different uh, um, solvents and things in, in the generic um, chemicals that are out there. There's a whole host of them and, and uh, you're just keeping up with the names is a, is a, is a, major, <laughs> is a, is a major study. Let alone but, pronouncing them. <laughs> absolutely. But there's, there's some also that are coming out um, as combos, not just one on their own. And they may have the, the primary name of the product, but it may be in combination with another one. And so in some situations, non-desirable that, that the companion one is put on the crop or in other situations, desirable that the companion one is put on the crop. So um, just don't go by the primary name of the product, read the whole thing. There is, there is lots of things with combo on the back of them or, um, or forte or something like that. They, they have this little subtle bit at the side that means that it is actually quite a different chemical when it's added to another one. Yeah, and that could catch you too. Absolutely. Um, white clover. White clover, uh, one of the most difficult crops in the world to manage. And in fact, uh, I have seen a book on, on white clover, which is nearly as thick as the Bible. And <laughs> the variables within it are huge. And um, farmers can make a crop or absolutely stuff it up quite easily. Yeah. And, and they can do it with too much irrigation. They can do it with too much fertility. They can do, with, uh, do it with shutting it up too early. Killing it with kindness killing it with kindness, um, not leaving enough uh, gaps between the plants and enough um, open uh, sites for light to penetrate to, to get the, uh, the floret buds going. And so it's a massive job to, to manage white clover and all sorts of things are in, um, put in place like topping the white clover uh, probably early next month and um, spraying it with things like paraquat to retard it if you've had it too uh, too advanced, and if you haven't got it, and it's a bit lagging and things, you start spraying out fungi, you start spraying out insects, you start irrigating it to play catch up. And so it's a minefield of managing white clover, it really is. And um, the guys who do it do it well, but if your um, phosphate levels are too high on your farm, you're going to grow hay crops, you're not going to grow seed crops. So only some soils some fertility situations suit white clover. So this book you're talking about is 17,000 reasons why you shouldn't grow white clover. Basically, <laughs> basically, and probably New Zealand farmers are the best in the world at doing it, Yeah, really. And, and uh, you know, um, one of the, the changes of the last sort of uh, 20 years has been to go into the wider rows so that clover has a chance to uh, spread out and the stolons run across the ground, light comes in, and it flowers. Um, it used to be in six inch rows and it was just always too bulky unless you were on dry, sandy, free draining soil. Then it was okay. <laughs> I'll leave it to you, Dennis. I'll just talk about it. Thank you very much indeed. Still to come on the program, we're going to be talking about farm accounting. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. Be Active begins here. 
in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Kerry, the company's office now needing more information. Yeah, this is just a heads up for those farmers operating as a company. From the 1st of July this year there was a change where um, accountants and lawyers have got to get more information of them. It's not a fact of us being nosy, um, it's actual legal requirement now. You've actually got to give your date of birth and your place of birth to the company's office. Statistics or something, is it? That's uh, behind all yeah, that? Yeah, there's a wee bit behind it. It's basically, I think, it's to make sure that the right people are actually directors, um, to make sure there's no overseas directors. And, and that you know it's all matched up and there's no bankrupts and those sort of things. So it's not anyone being nosy, you've just got to do it. Um, no one on the public record will know about it, so it's all secret, but you've got to do it when the annual returns file with the company's office. So that could be any time during the year, it just depends on when it's actually due. Uh -huh. So it's not when you just form the company, it's, no. it's after that. Yeah, when you form the company you've got to do it, so from that point it doesn't matter, the company's office has got it already. If this is the existing companies, they haven't had to provide it in the past. Um, so now they do, and it's just to make, make sure you give it to your accountant or lawyer when you see them. And I guess if somebody joins into the company and is a new, new director, yep. that has to happen. Yeah, they've got to give the same details, their full name, date, birth, address, all those sort of things, and, and give the, the um, signature to say that they're not disqualified from being a director. So they've got to go through all that legal sort of drama. Yeah, OK. I mean, but it, it's, it's there to protect. Yeah, it is. It's to make sure that the right people are operating, and you know, um, we haven't got anyone that's sort of hiding behind a company, basically. Because you know you get you get situations in this in Canterbury at the moment where a building company will go broke and all of a sudden the people who are involved with that one are involved with another one. Yeah, they could still do it, um, but it's just another way of tracking everybody, really. <laughs> Big brother. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's tax pooling? Well, we've got provisional tax coming up for you, sort of May June farmers. It's not far away. Tax pooling is another way of actually meeting your provisional tax obligations. So, yeah, like we've talked in the past, you can talk to ID, do an instalment arrangement. Um, there's now an well, intermediary out there, such as Tax Management New Zealand, where you could go to them and say, look, I want to borrow some money off you. Um, you agree how much you want to borrow, when you want to pay it. There's an interest cost, which is tax deductible. They pay some money across to another party, who's an independent trustee, who hold it in a special account with IRD. Now, when the due date comes up, you pay your money, they pay it to IRD, and it's as if you paid it on time. So you could effectively sort of tax pull for 12 months if you wanted. Just hang on a minute. Can you go back over that again? So you, you're, you're sort of borrowing, you're borrowing you're... money off another party. Yep. Um, that's all put into this big pool with IRD. And then when you pay your money to them, so it could be 12 months later, for example, it's put into your IRD account, but it's as if you actually paid it on time. And we can trust that pool of money? Yeah, it's, done, it's managed by an independent trustee. And their obligation is to make sure they track every transaction that goes through it. So it it's guaranteed to, to um, be there. But the proviso is you've actually got to make your payment to the person you borrowed the money off on the due date. Right, OK, so you're borrowing money, paying interest, yep. but it's not going to be the same interest if you're late with IID. Yeah, it's going to be a, a um, cheaper option. So you, know, you could be saving sort of 1%, 2 3%, depending on how much you're borrowing and for how long you're going to borrow it. When, so, you, when you hear some of the mortgages that are about... <laughs> yeah, and, and it, it can be easier than getting off the bank as well, because some people go to the bank to try and borrow it. This is another option where you don't actually have to tell your bank manager if you're you know, right near the limit of your borrowing and they're not prepared to give you any more. You yeah. can go and see this third We party are not and, comfortable, is the saying, isn't yes, it? Yes, they do, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you can sort of lump your money in with everybody else. So you're using someone else's money effectively for a short period of time. Yeah, okay, so it's like a, a yeah, yeah, a bit like an overdraft, but it's not. Yeah, it is, yeah. Yes, yeah. It's the same sort of thing, yeah. 
brings us round really to bank and, I, and IRD and the two having a conversation. Yeah, what we're sort of saying is you've got to be careful what you're saying to the bank. Um, any discussion you have with the bank manager is not actually confidential to the IRD. So if you go into your bank and say, it's hey, look, confidential you know, to the IRD. Yeah, so they can come in and have a look at what the bank manager notes are if they want. So if you say, I'm going to buy the block of land down the road, you know, hold it for six months and flick it off for a quick profit, you know, can you lend me some money in the short term? IRD could find that out and actually charge you the tax on that profit if they wanted. So it's a case of just watching what you say to them because they inevitably sort of get you into the situation where it feels like a comfortable chat and you sort of tell them everything that's going on. What you would be traditionally you should, able to do. Yes, yeah, uh, you yeah. Know, it's, uh, but if they start making notes, you need to be very careful about what they're noting, uh, make sure they're writing the right things down, and that straight after me, you make your own notes of what you think you told them. So that if you know, IRD do go to your bank and say, hey, did they have a meeting, what did they tell you? You can then say, well, this is what my recollection of the events were. Would it be a good idea to, to send your bank manager person and I, a, an email when you get Always back. good to have a follow-up to the bank and manager. Say, My understanding of the meeting is yep. as follows. Yes, and get them to confirm back if you can. Um, and it's also a checklist for them to make sure you know, they're going to do what you want them to do. But yeah, so it's just, you've got to watch what you say to them and what they're writing down. Because you know, they could write the wrong thing down, unintentionally, and that could put you into a tax trap. Whew. Now let's go back to what the, the situation that you mentioned about flicking of the next door neighbour through mm -hmm. pretty quickly. Yes. Why wouldn't they pick that up anyway? Well, they will, but you know you could say, well, I, you know, cash flow meant I had to sell it off, so it wasn't oh, intentional. Right, yeah. But if you've got a bank manager note that says, you know, he's going to make a quick fifty grand profit, straight away they get, their eyes are going to light up and say, we've got you, because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, they do get the record of every land transfer that goes through. Yes, they do. And then you know they'll they'll trace the money and sort of see what's happened and. Yeah. I mean, would we expect? IRD to go to bank managers very often? Not unless they've got good cause. So if you were, certainly if you've got you know, two or three properties that you, you're changing every so often, definitely they'll probably do that. Um, or if they think they've got an excellent case against you but just want a bit of extra backup, mm. they'll you know, serve some documents on the bank to disclose everything that they've got on file. So it's not unheard of and it does happen quite regularly. I mean, you can't open a bank account now without giving IRD details. Oh, exactly, yeah. And if you've got a, a trust or something like that now, you've also got to say that you haven't got overseas trustees involved and because that also puts you into a different tax sort of area as well. So there's all sorts of things that they, they need now. No, they can't come at you, can they, IRD? They can't ring no, you it, up and say, no. Coat Williams, I saw him coming out of your office. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Anything that you talk with your accountant and lawyer, um, pretty much legally privileged. Okay, but IRD are able to go into your bank accounts, for example, and take monies out. Yes, they can. All they've got to do is send out a letter to your bank saying, "This person owes this money. Please deduct this money." They'll send you a copy at the same time, and you normally get two or three day notice um, before they're due to do it, which will either get you to do something or they'll just <laughs> take the money. <laughs> <laughs> There'd be no bigger incentive to do something. Yeah, some people actually ignore it. You're um, kidding me? No, they just they don't open the mail. They see an IRD letter. Oh, I've got a bill due. And next minute they're on the phone saying, oh, they've taken all this money in their account. They can't do that. Well, legally they can. If they know you've got money in a bank account and it's in your name, they can come and take it. Company name? If it's in a company name and you owe personally, no, they can't. But if the company did, yes. So it depends on whose name that bank account is in. Okay, so yeah, so it's really it is. It, it is a bit big brother. Yeah, they, they know what's going on. They get, you know, they've got a good, good system there. And of course now they're looking to upgrade their system for the future and make it even more... Uh, observant of what's going on. You and I have said probably 17,000 times, oh Kerry, that if you communicate with them, yep. if you talk to them, and you play along with their rules, yep, they're fine. They'll, they'll do everything they can to keep yep, you going. Yep, they definitely will. And they'll, you know, they'll even send out staff to help you if you're really struggling. I've had that. So you know, it's, if you work with them, they're fantastic people. If you ignore them, then they're big, bad, and ugly, really. That's how, yeah, so how just they don't, come across. Just don't mess with them. Exactly, yes. <laughs> yeah. Kerry, thank you very much indeed. Damn good advice, that don't mess with IRD. In just a moment, we find out who or what is Owl Farm. Now, you're tied up with a school. Is it... Yep, so Owl Farm is a demonstration dairy farm which has been set up um, as a joint venture partnership between Lincoln University and St Peter's School up in Cambridge. So St Peter's have um, obviously got the school, they've got a surrounding dairy farm that they've always had uh, since the school's been basically formed, so 75 years old. 
Um, the joint venture was formed on the very successful Lincoln University demonstration dairy farm. So obviously, um, looking at uh, w our main goal is to apply proven research utilising good iron farm practice to become an exemplar in dairy production, economic performance and um, environmental footprint. So it's reasonably ambitious, it's sort of I guess the trifecta of what all of the, uh, the dairy industry is trying to achieve at the moment, obviously production. Um, profitability and sustainability which is um, obviously a, a pretty critical one at the moment with changing legislation right throughout the country. So um, yeah that's sort of the, 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 the cusp of what we're trying to do there. Uh, we've got on some awesome um, industry partners much the same as Lincoln University so we've got uh, Fonterra, LIC, PGG Rights and Seeds, uh, Opus, Westpac, LIC um, and Dairy NZ so awesome partners that are involved they financially contribute to um, run the demonstration farm and are obviously very critical in um, you know, providing the knowledge and the skills and the capabilities within um, their organisations to ensure we can develop an all-inclusive sort of a system which does um, you know, I guess en encompass a sustainable profitable farm system that we're all trying to strive for so really really good thing for the Waikato um, there's not really much like it in the Waikato um, there's a lot of research farms around but as a demonstration farm, we're absolutely, um, you know, committed to providing, you know, uh, implementing proven research. Um, and I think, you know, in this day and age, there's a lot of farmers that have got a huge amount of anxiety with um, probably, uh, you know, the volatility of the global marketplace and obviously some changing reg leg legislation um, environmentally. A lot of people are probably um, a little bit anxious around what the future holds. So it's really good to be able to provide, hopefully, some practical. Um, solutions which might be applicable to other people's farms around uh, how they can become yeah, more profitable or sustainable. That's the, the, the gist of it I guess. How do you get your information out? Yep, so uh, we've got obviously um, our website which is up and running. We, um, we have a range of data that we collect on a weekly basis from the likes of milk production, um, animal health data, pasture production data, nitrogen you know, and, and fertiliser use data. Um, obviously climatic is a big one for us in terms of you know what, what our growing conditions are like with um, being our system still predominantly pasture based. So we have um, that information which we gather weekly and um, which we upload to our website. Uh, we've got a lot of graphs and a lot of visual displays of how we present that information. Uh, similarly to the Lincoln University Demonstration Dairy Farm we have uh, four focus days a year where we try and encourage as many um, of our sort of farming audience as possible to come along and we I guess communicate different things that we're trying on farm, how we've gone about implementing them, what they mean for us, what the benefits are, what the negatives are, um, give them sort of I guess the, the whole range of, um, of that. Um, we work really closely with a lot of our partners in terms of the, the rural professional organisation. Um, you know, get a lot of them to come in. They use our facilities for meetings, so you know, trying to encourage um, and educate some of those guys around what we're doing, so that they can go forth and, and I guess spread that message throughout their farming um, networks. Uh, we have monthly uh, newsletters which go out. Obviously, Facebook, um, Twitter's about to be uh, developed sometime pretty soon. Um, so I mean, that, that's our main area really um, around probably getting the message out there but we are first year in and for us a really big part of, of first year is, is getting that profile, getting that credibility and building a reputation so that's really critical for us at the moment and, and I guess um, you know we've been quite fortunate as well we've got a really good relationship with the Waikato Regional, uh, the Waikato Times sorry, um, we've got an editorial column um, in their Waikato Farmer magazine so that those are all really good networks and avenues I guess for us to try and get this message out there. How's the season been in the Waikato? Uh, it's been a pretty challenging season to be fair, it's um, certainly been a baptism of fire for me. Um, like I've come from an environmental background, uh, I'm a fifth generation off a dairy farm in um, Rotorua that's been in the family for five generations so um, you know the environmental sustainability of, of making sure that as an industry we can continue for a few more generations is, is really important to me. Um, and growing up in that environment obviously the cows and grass side of things I've, I've always you know been reasonably um, adept in having those conversations but um, I've certainly learnt um, by getting thrown in the deep end with, with this season. Uh, climate wise we've had a really difficult July and August, um, it's been really really uncharacteristically cold and wet um, and so as a result of that we're probably two to three hundred kgs um, of dry matter per hectare behind where we would like to have been. Uh, we made a bit of a strategic decision last year to pull our calving date back uh, a week and a half because we've had some really really good uh, winter grass growth the last couple of years. So. We wanted to harvest that, um, that quality while it was available um, but then obviously this season happened and uh, it hasn't been too forthcoming in that sense so it's been a bit challenging from the climatic perspective, obviously the payout's been quite challenging as well um, and we have had some staffing issues, um, our, our long serving 
farm manager had to resign due to um, you know, heart issues. So that's been quite challenging, but I guess that's dairy farming and it keeps it, uh, it keeps it interesting. And certainly in a seasons like this when you've got uh, climatic factors that are contributing to lower pasture production and therefore lower milk production, we're about 6% behind where we would like to be. Um, and obviously low payout years, I think you know these kind of years it's as important as ever to hopefully have these demonstration farms where we can take a bit of that risk on um, that other farmers may not necessarily be prepared to do and that we can then communicate back what we've done, what worked, what didn't work um, so they can go home and, and obviously try it for themselves. Big question, are you going to make any money this season? Uh, we will make a little bit of money, uh, not a lot of money. Um, we've sort of been in survival mode to a certain extent with, um, with obviously our employment which is a big cost for our business um, and we've had to be playing a bit of uh, uh, release staff at the moment so that's uh, sort of changing our budget a little bit but um, we're probably reasonably fortunate we might not have the same debt loading that a lot of other farms have got so um, our working expenses are, um, you know, aren't too bad, they're below what you know, they're around sort of that $3.00 um, Three dollars sixty to three dollars eighty mark. So we, we are making money in that regard. We do have debt, but maybe not the same amount of debt as what a lot of other farmers do have. So, um, and I guess being a farm that is owned by the trust board, we don't have any drawings, so we're not really taking anything out of the farm from a um, from a personal perspective. So, we will make a little bit of money, yes, but not a lot of money though. No. Yeah. You're tied up with a school, is it, what, how big a tie up is it? Absolutely, um, so we're, we're really fortunate to have the school involved and, and sitting in the Waikato, sort of I guess the stronghold of New Zealand dairying um, long term, a lot of the actual school role um, do come from rural delivery addresses so it's a really good way to be able to give back in that sense but at the same se um, sense you know we hear a lot from government around the shortfall in, in um, you know, young skilled people coming into the into the primary industry sector, particularly dairy, which is obviously a really big earner for us. So, it's a really good opportunity for us to be able to work with the students and, I guess, provide them some genuine opportunities around what happens on a farm and and obviously provide some career opportunities, which you know they might not have um, necessarily. Uh, considered previously so we've already started working with the likes of obviously agriculture and horticulture but geography, geology, uh, ge uh, geography chemistry, biology, um, obviously the bu business and entrepreneurial centre so the e economics, accounting, business studies really really important, um, IT, statistics, um, you know a really big grasp of the students um, and, and just giving them some really genuine um, farm uh, experiences I guess and, and as well as obviously the rural sector that uh, comes to the school there's a huge urban influence at the school so it's a really good opportunity to hopefully try and um, encourage some of that um, probably urban rural divide that's probably been coming around the last few years so to be able to educate some of the urban um, students as well around what actually happens on farm and what we're trying to achieve is, is a really big positive of what we're trying to do so um, yeah I think so far that's been really positive and, and really going to uh, a great work in progress around um, how we can further integrate students into that farm and, and get them involved. Absolutely great isn't it when you see what's around now for people who want to get into our industry. After the break it's a catch up on the season as far as veggies are concerned. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Robin, it looks pretty dry. How's the season been? Yeah, well, it stayed cold for a long time, and it held. It was good for some crops. It was good for the spring broccoli because it just held the heads tight and firm with slower growth rather than a big rush of growth that makes them go a bit light and fluffy. And uh, so it's been good for that. And for most of the other crops, things have just been slow to happen. Like the, the real early spuds, they just stayed under the ground for quite a long time, didn't do much, and they're probably two or three weeks later than what they were last year. 
for a full emergence. And now, of course, we've had a whole lot of nor'westers in Canterbury, so it's gone the other way. Yeah, so it's, some of the paddocks were still just moist enough and it was still cold enough, so I wasn't in a big hurry to, to get out there and start too early. So we sort of held back a bit on some of the groundwork and, and then we were all programmed to get out there and get into it and then it, it blew. How much of your topsoil disappeared off into the ocean? Well, well, no, you know, because of the wind, you stop. So, so that sort of put us back and then the wind stopped and then it's warmed up and it's like, right, all guns blazing, but some of the other cultivation work would like to be a bit further ahead on that. But uh, Roman, what's the process to go from one season into the next as far as the paddocks are concerned? Oh, depending on what crop it's going into, but uh, like so this paddock here, it's, it was a cereal crop last year, had a bit of uh, grass in there for a bit of grazing during the winter and the spring and it's just had a, a like a round up and then we've given it a few passes with the multi disc machine down there with the roller and then ridge it up and uh, and put the separator through and get the clod free beds for the potato planting and a bit of fertiliser goes in before the last pass just that gets work done and then it's in with the planter. Now the Roundup, that's not going to get the new stuff that's coming up. It's just dealing with the weed that's there at the time and helps the, the grass make sure it dies and the roots release from the soil so it works better. And I guess you just hope there's not too much seed buried there. Oh there's always seed there, you, you're, not, you're nothing more sure than that so we'll get that with a pre-emerge and a look around up just before the potatoes come up and, and that, that'll give us good weed control for the whole crop. So really it's a pretty busy time for you horticulturalists at the moment? Yeah this is full noise at this time of the year because you're getting your ground work to get your crops in, we've got the potato crops going in, you're still tidying up some of last year's crops that are coming out with broccoli and things that have, have, have been harvesting into the spring. So a lot of cultivation work, a lot of getting crops in and you, you want to get everything in in the right conditions so you can't get too far ahead of yourself but you want to be on time because I mean you never know from one year to the next just what, what on time is but quite often you've still got to be referencing a a point on the calendar because you can be sitting there thinking it's not quite ready, not quite ideal to go and then in Canterbury it can switch from one thing to the other and all of a sudden you can you can go from thinking you're about right to two weeks behind and then you get a week's wet weather thrown in amongst that which would be nice but uh, uh, then you're chasing your tail from there. Irrigation? Yeah well, we haven't started any, I say we haven't started any irrigation, we've got a bit of beetroot we're just emerging at the moment so we've had to run the irrigator over that twice just to soften it up so the, the, the ground capping a wee bit just to help that come through so we get more even emergence so we can then have a better go at the weed control from there but most of our crops um, you know would it, a lot of our paddocks we're not planting until October November like the potato main planting is happening now so the ground's been fallowed through till now so there's, there's good moisture reserves there at the moment pumpkin ground you know for a lot of it at the moment we're, we're more on a, on a weed control phase on fallowed ground um, while we're getting crops in the ground we don't really kick into much irrigation until November, December when the crops are starting to draw whereas um, you know, if you're dairy farming you've got uh, grass that's growing all the time at the moment and it's, it's sucking moisture out every day whereas you know, a paddock like this there's, there's really not much moisture draw and then you've got your crop and farmers a lot of the autumn sown crops you know they've got a bit of growth on them now so they're, they're sucking a lot of moisture on, a, on an average day whereas you know, we've got bare paddocks they're not, they're not drawing much Looking back over last season, how did you guys go? Did you do all right? Yeah, it's been a reasonably good season for us. Certainly, it was good to have a, a slightly more normal season for you know want of a better terms after the, the wet one we had the year before. That was that was nobody's friend, and it was good this year to, to have good digging conditions for, for getting the potato crops out. It was it was a colder winter, but that that's fine. You don't mind that. It's uh, cold's fine. Wet's wet's what I'd prefer not to have. Yeah, but it's uh, gone good for the, you know, it's been a good winter for the broccoli on our, on our winter ground. That, that's gone well with the, the drier, colder season. Pest control, or pest pressure, do you have problems with things like springtails? Yeah, they, they, they start to be a problem now on you know, emerging crops like the beetroot and the like. And well, it's been colder for longer, that's just held some of those things back. And, you know, we normally might have had to go in and deal with a wee few aphids and some of the spring broccoli crops by now but they're only just starting to show up now so that's that's a good thing so we haven't had to go near any of those. The wheel of marketing continues to turn, what's your latest trick? Oh I wouldn't say it's the latest trick, it's uh, one I've been working on for um, a wee while now, the diversions on the production front have sort of held it back a bit but um, on the shelves now we've got our new beetroot prepack bag so we're a bit excited about that, It's it's been a long time since it uh, 
got the kick off and uh, it's come to fruition now so we're quite pleased about that. It's, uh, it's a look on the shelves, mainly in the New Worlds, so you'll definitely see it there. And of course red beet's becoming very fashionable. Well it is a, it is a good vegetable, I mean it's, you know, a lot, lot of vegetables are good vegetables, it's, you know your grandparents and what have you always knew they were good and healthy and you should eat them but didn't necessarily have the science to go with it and just nowadays they've got a bit of science to go with it and everyone suddenly it's like they're rediscovering something that everyone always knew anyway and uh, people are getting a bit more creative now too with uh, how they cook things and present them and there's a lot of people with all these food programs are a bit more interested in having a, having a go at something too especially when they've actually seen and someone's talked them through it on TV and there's some very nice dishes to be made with with all sorts of vegetables not just the beetroot of course and yeah it's good for you. Now, DNA in plants and grapes in particular, you don't sort of think of plants and DNA. Um, I, I guess most people don't. Um, not, those of us who are paid to think about it quite a lot. But most people think about um, testing for quality. There's other chemicals that people test all the time. So a BRICS test for soluble solids is often when you're trying to test uh, how much sugar is in, is in a grape to see if it's ripe. Or um, people test for phenolics to get an idea of the flavour of the juice. So DNA is just another chemical that's in every cell, um, but it gives us other information. So rather than telling us whether a grape is ripe, it tells us um, hereditary information, so what variety of grape it is, um, and we can link that to information about where it will grow best or um, what, kind of, uh, what kind of wine it will make in the end. So yeah, it's, a, it's another chemical that gives us information. So you're taking a hold of the guesswork out? It is, I guess, yeah. I mean, we, or don't guess, we test, and that's, then we take away the, the assumptions that are, that are often made, and it actually can give a definitive result about, about the genetic um, background. So I guess if you're buying vines to, to plant in your vineyard, you don't have to wait for over three years to make sure you bought the right ones. Absolutely, yeah. And that's, that's quite a big problem, is buying a vine and then saying, that well, this has a leaf shape that looks like um, Sauvignon Blanc, so we assume it is, and then you propagate up 10 hectares of, of vines and on the assumption that that's what they are. But when we look at uh, molecular markers we can, in the DNA, we can actually say this has a, um, a piece of hereditary information that is unique to Sauvignon Blanc, so we, we can be confident. And we can test that just based on a sort of a tiny little punch from a, um, from a leaf. Are you looking at this to get new varieties? Yes, we are. So um, in a, an associated technology, what we do is we, we started by looking at the fact that New Zealand actually has um, a high incidence of new varieties forming. Um, and what I mean by that is new, new clones and new types of a variety are usually identified by finding a branch in, a, in the vineyard that looks like it's un doing unusually well or has unusually big grapes or something like that. And then they take a cutting from that and they grow an entire vine off, off of it. And so for example, Pinot Blanc is a white variety that was established from a, a red variety, Pinot Noir, which stopped producing that red pigment. And so um, that kind of uh, change is easy to identify in the field. But if you're looking for something like disease resistance, it's very hard to identify without a, a devastating disease coming through your crop and, and ruining them all. So what we do is we, um, we've studied what causes vines to change like that. Why would a new branch suddenly be different from the rest of the vine? Um, and that's to do with how the, the, the genetics, the DNA, slowly changes over time. And we then take samples of the vine and um, in tissue culture we, we separate out individual cells and then we monitor those cells as they undergo these small genetic changes. And then we, using um, growth media, we grow them up into individual plants. So we get one plant from every single cell and that means that we have a unique new plant that's, that the entire plant has those small changes. So if a, a change, like in the example of the red to white, if that occurs in one of the cells, we end up with a whole new plant that would have um, white grapes. So it's, a, it's the same thing that happens naturally in a vineyard, but because we're doing it a cell at a time, we can monitor the precise genetic changes that occur and we can generate an entire population where each vine has a, a small subtle change in it. Be a good time saver. Absolutely, yeah, because we we can actually monitor what has happened, what has changed in the, um, in the plant as it, as it occurs. We can say as soon as the plant is maybe a sort of five centimeter young plantlet, we can take, extract some DNA, see if anything's changed, and then even look at what genes have changed. We can say this is a change that occurred in a gene that is likely to affect the, the yield of, the, of grapes ultimately. And so we can pick the ones that look like they'll be winners and grow those up into full vines rather than 
um, hoping you find something and generating thousands of vines with a, a possibility that, they'll, that some of them will have something unique in them. Daryl, the end user, how long before what you're doing here in the lab actually ends up in people's vineyards? Um, so we've created a pilot population of about 200 vines already um, and those are, we're, we're speaking with the New Zealand Wine Growers uh, Association who've been um, quite excited to access them as potential new varieties. Um, we are now just starting to expand that population so we'll be producing several thousand new vines um, that have each have subtle changes. So um, ultimately it probably, it doesn't take that long to produce the new vines, it only probably takes a year or 18 months, but the, the phenotyping which is looking at the, what has changed in the plant and actually assessing whether it will be good for New Zealand's environment and whether it's, it'll be um, an, an optimal crop and whether it'll grow, um, and whether it'll produce good wine actually ultimately, um, takes a bit of time. So that, that we'll do in combination with nurseries and, and wine growers to actually assess this this vine looks good in the lab, it appears to have a better yield, but is the wine it actually makes um, any good to drink? So I guess this is no different to people working on getting a new wheat variety or ryegrass variety? Yeah, it's no different to finding this thing naturally. So we're not um, genetically modifying the plants in that we're not introducing any foreign DNA, we're not manipulating their, their DNA physically, we're, um, we're just watching what happens in the natural what how cells naturally change, but um, rather than hoping we find them in a, a field of wheat, to take your example, we're actually screening them as as it occurs in real time. How did you get into all this? Um, well, my background was in um, in molecular biology, and, and I studied at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. So I was in the middle of the winelands there, but I was actually um, looking at forensic DNA markers. So the markers that we look at um, to discriminate one variety from another are essentially the same markers that are used in paternity testing or any other forensic testing in humans. Um, and we were looking at um, markers that can discriminate one popula population of abalone, which we call in New Zealand power, from another um, because there's a lot of smuggling. In fact, 80% sort of, of, the, of the abalone in South Africa are ultimately smuggled out to the east and the police want to be able to um, seize a shipment and be able to say this when when the um, when the people holding the power said no this is this is from China originally be able to do a DNA test and say no this these are from a population from Cape Town and we have a, a DNA test to show them so it's it's much like paternity testing. So DNA is definitely very very much part of science. Absolutely and. Um, my passion is really bringing it to agricultural science. It's been used in um, human and health sciences in a long time. So there's lots of DNA tests available for hereditary diseases. Um, if anybody who knows their blood type ultimately has had an indirect DNA test done on them because they know um, some genetic hereditary information about themselves. And so it's really been very powerful for people to be able to know, um, for example, some of these devastating diseases that, that are late onset, whether you're a carrier for them and so that you could um, prepare or take lifestyle choices which would actually affect that. Um, and now we're trying to introduce these technologies to the agricultural industry so that people can actually get genetic information about the plants that they're growing and actually use these to produce better crops. Great to see that there's lots happening as far as the wine industry is concerned. A passion for many of us. After the break it's communication. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be Active amino acid biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active amino acid biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature, good for the plant good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. 
The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Dave, communication has come a very long way. <laughs> yeah, it has, Rob. Look, it's, uh, it's the digital age, and we've, um, with that brings a whole um, plethora of, uh, of opportunities for, um, particularly on the farm, um, for farmers to communicate, whether it be with radios, with the cell phones, uh, from the cell phone to the radio, um, internet connecting. It's just uh, incredible what we can offer now. It's almost science fiction for a lot of people. Yeah, it is. Look, you know, the uh, this look, you know, you look at your kids and what they're playing with today, and what we play with as kids. It's uh, it's a it's a totally new world, and the same applies with technology. Um, it's in a constant state of evolution, and we're seeing this every day from Motorola. Uh, this f uh, opportunities to talk to people, no matter where you are in New Zealand or around the world, uh, through your radios or through your cell phones or both. I, um, through your laptops and so on, it's just fantastic. So how do you marry a cell phone where you're in Queenstown and your farm's in Northland and you've got radios on the Northland farm? How can you do that? Well, nowadays it's actually very easy. Uh, as I said before, um, the, the, the radios now have their own IP addresses. So effectively what we can do now is connect that radio through the World Wide Web, through the internet, to a smartphone. So if you're in Northland or Gold Coast or London watch, uh, in England watching the rugby, you can still maintain contact to the, your worker or your manager or your wife or whatever, the husband, whatever the case may be, from the cell phone to that radio. So you might have a, a, a moment of inspiration. You think, gee, I, I think we should move that irrigation to paddock number four. You can do that from your smartphone to your farm manager in Rakaia or, or Timaru or Invercargill. Um, and he can talk back to you. So the manager, whether it be he or she, can contact you on their radio and get you on your cell phone? That's exactly right. Yeah, so, um, so now you're not constricted by the old um, standard, I suppose, where radios were just connecting via either a repeater or th on a simplex where the radios were talking from radio to radio. Now the radios have been opened up globally. So it doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing, um, you can talk back to the farm or the or your construction site, uh, mining operation doesn't really matter at all. Um, from your cell phone uh, to that radio to that man you want to talk to, um, and I think a lot of the frustration has been with cellular has been, you know, when you're wanting an answer, you don't want to get that high. You've reached Rob. I can't come to the phone right now. I'm talking on the TV. Yeah, yeah. You want to be able to. Um, you want to be able to uh, get that. Get that answer. Yeah. Speaking of which, well, you are exactly. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's proof in the pudding, isn't it? Correct. So I've got, I've got a just, I've got a program on my smartphone um, that that was actually that going off uh, where I can, I'm connected to a whole radio network, so I can talk to the radios to our technicians, and uh, with a click of a button, and and they are in the field. I'm actually conversing with them. I'm discussing what what needs to be done, uh, and it works really well. So. <clears throat> You hear stories about, oh, the, the cell phone coverage here is rubbish, but are you able to get around that? Or oh, absolutely. Put, what do you do? Do you put trans, trans transponders on there? Or no, something? no, the, the, the great thing is, um, you know, we've got a couple of, well, we've got a, a number of um, um, uh, locations in Canterbury uh, up in the back countries. You know, you, you're thinking about the Hakateri here in sort of areas, the Algidus, where, you know, the Coleridge's and those sort of areas. So those areas were always traditionally restrained by, uh, for communications and in cellular, by the fact they didn't have repeaters or they, they had to rely on just radio to radio. So now what we do is we connect, connect the farmer, the farm, farm workers, through the internet uh, with a simple um, um, program. Mm -hmm. And so if you leave, the, so if, 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 the, if the farmer wants to leave the property and go to town, go and visit farmlands, he can now talk back to that farm via the internet. So the, the radios are talking to the internet and then out to the smartphones. So this is sort of 
satellites and stuff, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's actually World Wide Web. So, so if you think about it, it's kind of like Skype for a radio. So the radio is now, uh, um, now connecting to that um, software that you download for free. And, um, and of course, there are infrastructure costs, but, but now you can actually talk to that radio. And uh, like I say, you could be in, 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 in the UK watching the rugby. Uh, you can still be talking back to your farm uh, manager or farm workers. But you need you need one of those phones with a big screen on the front. You can't use your traditional ones? Yeah, you can use any smartphone will work. Um, and the radio, you mean the radio? The radio, um, all the new Motorola radios have the ability now to um, connect through the internet. So it's uh, fantastic. Do you, do you sort of get a five-day a five day educational thing with this? Well, you know, because it's all about my head, mate. Well, look, you know, Rob, it's, like, it's as simple as downloading the app from, from the um, App Store. Or and I, you guys or, would do that for you? We can do all of that. It's very simple. Look, you know, it's, you know there are some infrastructural costs involved. Um, it's not as scary as people think, uh, and it's so simple to use. Look, it's as simple as opening the app just like you'd open up iTunes, hit the app, and it turns into a, effectively turns into a two-way radio, and you hit the wee button and go, hey, Rob, how are you doing? And that's, that's it. Job done. It's very simple. What if his name's Steve? Well, that's a problem. Uh, <laughs> don't know any Steves out there. Uh, but you know a few Robs to the password is. I just you like using your name. It's so easy, it comes straight off the tongue. But no, seriously. No, I mean, I mean the, what I'm driving at is that there's people who, who are further on in years sure. who will look at that and go, I don't even know what an app is, and I use my cell phone to make phone calls, Yep. not not to check the weather forecast, which you can do, of course. Absolutely, you can do anything you like. And look, we can do all of that for you. We'll, 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 ins we'll ins install it. You know, the, 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 the go-to solution for a lot of people is to have a repeater on the farm. If it's a big property and it's out in the back blocks, sure, a repeater still has its place, and, and we do that very, very well. And it doesn't matter whether it's Mesopotamia or Mount Algidus or Molesworth, it doesn't matter. We can mm. do all of that. Um, but now, what I'm saying now, you can actually um, utilise the power of the internet to unbridle yourself from that, from that being just on the farm radio, to now be able to be mobile. And uh, if you do go off the farm, or you're, you know, you're, you're on holiday, you can still maintain that contact. It's got to be a great day for the corporates who are sitting in an office in Auckland or Hamilton or wherever, mm -hmm. and the farm manager can go to the chairman and say, "Look, we're." I want, to, I want to do this, that, or the other thing. I want to go and visit Drummond and Etheridge and buy a new tractor. Absolutely. So you can, all, you can actually become a conference um, facility for you, a conference call facility. There's, I mean, we have um, guys who have multiple farm um, assets, and they want to talk to their farm managers all at once. They might want to have a toolbox meeting over the radio or over the phone. So you can do all of that, and you can have your own little channels. A little can, conference call. Of course, you can have a conference call, and you can also, if you want to, you can bring people in. So you might you might have a farm manager and and a, um, uh, your milking manager. You think I want to bring I want to bring John in um, to to this call because it's important. So you can bring them in to the conversation on the radio to the smartphone. There's all sorts of opportunities. There. Wine makers and vineyard managers. Absolutely, there's so, there's so many sort of combinations where you do want to have those people in the same room. Yeah, look, and, and, and going back to that old chestnut we keep talking about, health and safety. You know, knowing where you guys are at, at all times, and that's becomes, um, uh, it's become more and more important, more relevant, and, uh, you know, there's no excuse these days to not give your guys good communications. It's so important. Or if you're on the, phone, on the farm on your own and your spouse is working in the city, that's pretty handy too. Yeah, well, look, uh, we've had that a, a number of times, and uh, saving yourself a few rucks on the road when you know when you know getting that phone call from the wife. Did you go to the supermarket and pick me up that wine? Um, or, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't oh, say milk, interestingly <laughs> enough. So. I only got the beer, <laughs> but you know, there, there's a there's a time saving factor, there's a yeah. money saving factor, and there's a safety factor. So, look, you know, it's the simplest thing in the world to do, and uh, I think you know it's look for, for for the sake of a phone call to me. Um, and I'll come out and I can give you all of those options on the property, um, and it's not as scary as you as people think. You know, and it's not the future; it's the current; it's the present. Look, you know that's right. You know we're future proofing your farm, we're future proofing your asset and your business. So we're we're, we're putting a ten year plus program onto the farm that'll that'll carry you through to uh, the 2025, 2030 at least. Dave, thank you very much. You're indeed. welcome. Now, if you'd like to uh, have another look at Dave's interview and check on some of the things he was saying, just go to our website, which is ontheland.co.nz. 
I'm Robert Coke Williams. You've either been watching or you've just missed the program. But I will be back at the same time next week. Until then, bye now.